in this room, so if uh, I drift off, please just sort of wave and I'll, I'll make sure to, to uh, speak uh, clearly and loudly. Uh, this paper uh, is uh, part of a, a large study of uh, about 800 National Science Foundation awardees. And so this is a, a survey uh, to understand what people see as the threat to their data. And when we think about data uh, research, we think about the scientific method. And uh, we think of things like uh, people like Isaac Newton who developed this whole process where we have a paper, we have experiments, and we have data. Uh, and for our researchers like uh, from the past, uh, data was collected on paper, well in Newton's case on vellum, uh, and it lasted very well. Right? We have all of those, all of Newton's notebooks, we have all of his data, we have all of his experimental ideas, the process that he went through. Um, but in the digital age, uh, the last 15 years of data, uh, of scientific research has really shifted to almost exclusively digital data. And so that means that instead of on vellum or on paper, uh, we have data that is now on optical media, on magnetic media, uh, dynamic uh, processes like video, um, visualized data that has impact XML data that gets visualized, uh, in a specific way. And then we have thousands of formats of data. We have data that's uh, in proprietary formats, data that's uh, uh, stored in, in a wide variety of media. And preserving this data is really problematic. So let's first talk, make sure that we have a common understanding. So when I talked about data in this survey to these researchers, we talked about any information that could be stored in digital form. Anything. So really the broadest definition uh, that we could uh, of data. The nature of data is that it is dynamic. It evolves through the process. So uh, uh, researchers uh, uh, collect data, they organize it, they uh, present it, they apply it, and through each of those stages of this, of a generic data life cycle, the data changes. Um, and most of those, uh, so managing that data throughout those changes becomes more and more uh, challenging. And many uh, of these life cycles that describe the processes of data have at some point the idea of an archive, some kind of a preservation infrastructure that's going to manage this data over time. And so preserving data has uh, become a part of uh, major or research organizations have become very interested in this, uh, mostly because external funding agencies are pushing them to do that, right? We have to pr provide a, a data management plan to NSF. Those are really uh, challenging researchers and, and research organizations to be able to uh, respond to this. And so, um, the idea of assessing the risk of threats to preservation have become, has become an important theme throughout the literature. And there's a number of schemes that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but most of them, again, are within this context of a preservation infrastructure. So uh, a technology, a repository, um, an organization with uh, resources, both financial and human, to manage this data. So there's, there's a process that's implied with many of these um, preservation uh, uh, threats schemes. But I was really interested in the question of what happens to data before it gets to a repository? What are the threats that can happen, the threats that can affect data? And what actually are the data losses? Can we quantify some amount of, of, of data loss? And what are researchers doing within their own labs to mitigate these risks? So those were the research questions. So these schemes, these different um, ways of thinking about threats uh, have been developed over the past 10 years or so. Um, 
uh, and they come in, in different varieties. So one of these schemes deals with the idea of component failures, management failures, so thinking about the different pieces of hardware, and thinking about uh, management failures, disasters and attacks, and attacks meaning attacking external uh, or internal people trying to uh, maliciously do something. Uh, another scheme talks about physical threats, uh, technology threats, human threats, and industrial uh, or institutional th threats. So those would uh, be the equivalent of those management things, financial issues. Uh, and the third scheme uh, it thinks about economic threats, human error, disasters, and attacks. But a more subtle um, look at this, a more nuanced look, uh, was developed that thinks about it uh, in a more um, a taxonomic way. So that we have vulnerabilities. So inherent to the technology, uh, there are issues, right? There are weaknesses in the technology <coughs> that can produce uh, uh, problems, that can create problems just by the very nature of the technology versus uh, direct threats, somebody or things actively working. And so we can think of those in terms of process and data and infrastructure uh, as vulnerabilities, disasters, attacks, uh, management, and legislation as threats. So how are these threats managed? How do we mitigate threats? Uh, and the primary mitigation strategy is good data management having good backups, having uh, uh, mirrored sites, having disaster recovery, business recovery, uh, resumption plans, all those things that we've learned uh, uh, throughout our uh, careers of how we take care of data. Uh, and we know that well-funded and well-established data repositories generally have these kinds of plans in place. Uh, there's dedicated staff. Uh, there's data centers with air conditioning and the right equipment uh, to protect this data uh, and to keep it secure. But again, these are repository centric. And since a very small amount of data actually make it to large data repositories, there are several studies showing that uh, somewhere around 15 to 25 percent of research data actually gets to a data repository. Uh, there's a lot of data that is at risk, right? There's a lot of uh, potential for uh, this data to be uh, uh, lost. And primarily, individual scientists are responsible to manage their own data, um, and they either through lack of funding or through uh, just you know, the independent spirit of most researchers, they end up doing this themselves, or their PhD students uh, do this work for them. There are not very many uh, uh, reports of lost research data. And the two that are the most famous, or perhaps infamous, uh, both happened out of NASA. Uh, one is that um, 173 uh, tapes of uh, the Apollo missions where they did uh, data gathering on lunar surface uh, uh, soil content and uh, atmospheric research uh, were just lost. The tapes went missing uh, from uh, the early 1970s. They were missing, uh, um, and then they were found again in 2008. Uh, and there was no equipment to read them, and it took them over two years to reverse engineer uh, and, and extract the data. Uh, and the other is uh, the first moon landing, so when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the moon, uh, another hundred and so tapes uh, just completely went missing and they've never been found. So the highest quality uh, recordings of those, of the moon landing, uh, went missing. So. Um, the lost data uh, was significant uh, in this case. And so I wanted to understand what other data was lost. And so I um, created a survey and sent it to um, 8,400 National Science Foundation awardees. I got uh, just under 900, 800 and 
97 researchers started the survey, and, and 724 took, uh, answered every single question. Uh, I picked them based on uh, domains uh, uh, of the directorates of the National Science Foundation. So people were categorized as either being in uh, you know, the geosciences, uh, all the different directorates. So that's how uh, the, the science, the domains were picked. They had to pick from that a set of domains, engineering, computer science, math, education, and social science. Most 52% were in the hard sciences and 23% in uh, engineering and computer science. I asked people about funding. Funding is a, runs, is a theme that runs through the um, literature as being important. Um, but it's hard to ask people, you know, are you well funded, right? Because nobody's going <laughs> to be well funded. Everybody wants more money. Uh, so I asked people whether they were uh, uh, in a range from exclusively funded by your institution to exclusively grant funded, thinking that that was a way to um, uh, to uh, understand a little bit more. Since uh, grant funders often have different requirements, uh, there's immediate cash that could be spent, in fact must be spent. Um, and so I, that was the, uh, the thinking behind uh, how we can feel about it, deal with funding. And then size of lab. So, um, <coughs> Uh, the size of labs is either you're an individual researcher, you're in a small lab, meaning under five uh, researchers, or you're in a lab, a large lab, over five researchers. And 17% uh, reported that they were individual researchers, 36 were in the small labs, and 47% were in the large labs. Uh, and 85% and were uh, grant uh, funded, exclusively or primarily grant funded. I got a really great distribution uh, geographically, so um, 334 unique research institutions, uh, every state plus Canada, Puerto Rico, Germany, and uh, the UK. Six states have had over 10 participating researchers. So here's the data. Here's what happened. So um, researchers res uh, reported uh, that um, over 50% reported some loss some data loss. Um, uh, malicious hacking was a very low, even though it's very high on those uh, uh, schemes that are in the literature, the preservation threats was very low uh, in this uh, study, either because um, we do a really good job at orga research organizations of preventing it, or it's a low, it's a, a, a low return um, uh, uh, site for hackers, right? Why would you Hack research data when you can hack target. Um, but human error was really the, the biggest one. Human error was very large, uh, both in inadvertent human error, like that, oh my gosh, what did I just do, feeling when you've done something dumb, or uh, by mistake. We just we didn't think we needed it at the time. We, we made a choice to delete this data and found out later we needed it again. Those two were the biggest, uh, uh, were some of the biggest. Uh, causes of loss. Uh, and that is sensitive to the size of labs. So the larger the lab, the more, or the large labs reported this more frequently than individual researchers. Uh, equipment malfunction um, and uh, equipment obsolescence and software uh, obsolescence also were, was sensitive to labs, to the size of labs and to two scientific domains, so um, geoscientists and the physical sciences reported that equipment failure uh, was, a really, uh, was a really big problem uh, for them. And uh, obsolescence, uh, again, was a, big, was a big problem. Again, physical disasters was a pretty low, um, was pretty low at, at 4%. The one thing that was really interesting to me was lost media, that actually losing the media was 10%. 10% of these researchers lost data because they couldn't manually track the CDs, which uh, relates to other research that says, you know, about 40% of research data is stored on CDs. So it's, it's, it's really a big uh, issue. 
And that mislabeled media, so having a CD but calling it something else, uh, was a problem. So we often think of metadata being the problem where we don't have a, um, a good description of what's the data, but even a, <laughs> an additional problem, we don't even label <coughs> the media uh, accurately. I asked people about uh, managing the data within the research lifecycle, and 55%, I was encouraged to find, thought that um, uh, doing that data should be managed from its creation, so that's really uh, encouraging, and again, that's sensitive to size of lab, so if you were in a big lab, that was more clearly uh, obvious to you. Um, people also uh, it, uh, said that they tried to back up their data as you know, according to best practice, so on a regular basis when data changed, they, they were uh, backing up their data, and that again was pretty encouraging. Uh, if funding was not an issue, would you choose different technologies uh, in your data storage, uh, in your data management environment? Uh, and 25% said that they would choose different storage technologies, they would save more data, uh, and they would pick different data management practices. So, um, and they would try uh, uh, different strategies as well. So people are understanding that they've got to do this, they feel like they're not quite doing it right uh, and want to get, uh, and would like to get professional staff uh, to help manage this data. So lost media is not really in any of those data preservation threats. Uh, ontologies or, or uh, schemes that we've talked about before. And it really is a significant threat. Uh, the NASA are, are an example, 10% of researchers in this survey reported it. Um, and uh, we need to start dealing with thinking about how when we do uh, work with students and researchers on data management, we really need to start thinking about removable media management. How do we manage these materials? Or, find ways for people not to store their data on removable media. Uh, researchers are well aware of their responsibility to mediate threat. Funding is a consistent constraint or, and, and threat to, media, to mitigation. Uh, the size of the lab increases complexity and that complexity causes error, primarily in terms of communication. Is this important data? Uh, are we doing things right? Uh, so, uh, this was a, a general overview to the threats of data preservation, uh, but there's a lot more that could be done. So, if we could uh, do look at it, have, create a study that would look at where in the life cycle threats happen more uh, regularly. Is it at the beginning, during the data collection? Is it during the quality control process, where people are uh, making dozens of new files? Is there uh, doing their different types of analysis, is it at the end of the project where they're wrapping things up, uh, where do the problems really happen. We could look more <coughs> at in-depth studies of migrations, uh, of mitigation strategies, so exactly, uh, you know, when you're doing a big broad survey, it's really hard to get really nuanced questions about uh, data practice. Uh, and so we could do a, a much more in-depth study of what the strategies are that researchers are actually doing. And it would be also interesting to see the relationship between um, the researchers uh, institutional infrastructure that they can use and, and their and their ability to maintain their own data so if they have a really strong data center uh, are they doing a better job or if they have a weak you know if they have a weak technical infrastructure in their organization is that providing a, a, a making a bigger risk for them for them to So in conclusion, uh, the assessment of risks and threats had really focused on the repositories. This study worked at looking at the individual uh, researchers. And um, because most data doesn't actually get to repositories, so understanding these risks are important. Researchers really try, we need to give them more support. Mm -hmm.
information and, and your uh, study. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Stacey? I have no microphone. I'm sorry. Can you speak loudly? Uh, I found it interesting that almost half of your uh, respondents said they would like to have someone help them. Mm -hmm. And so do you think that finding has any implications for the work of academic librarians? Um, I do think so. Um, uh, there is a, this is just one part, I did a much larger study and this is one part of it. There was another part where uh, I asked whether they wanted to have um, work with librarians primarily for metadata creation and um, it was about 25% said yes and 30% uh, said we, I don't know because and the comments I got because I did both qualitative and quantitative the comments were I just think the knowledge transfer would be so hard um, for the for the metadata creation uh, but I do think that there is a, a great opportunity for libraries and librarians to work with uh, uh, researchers to get data, uh, to manage it, to get it into a repository, into a, into a preservation infrastructure. So, yes, I think there is. Yes. So, I, I had had a similar question and was wondering if, so I mean, a lot of times um, university um, computing centers have mass storage. Right. And I wonder if a better place for that is not in the library rather than in the computing services because they, you know, they provide access but they don't really help people manage their data. Right. Um, and it seems like that might be a better fit. It could be. The problem with <coughs> data centers and with the places that I've worked is that they're only interested in you while you work there. Right? So you get another job, you take a and your data is, now you're stuck getting all your data, right? Because you no longer have an ID, you no longer have anything. But if, if, you know, libraries are persistent knowledge source. So from my perspective, that feels, it, that feels like a problem deferred to me, to say the data center. And they, they do it. There's a number of places that do it, but it's the long-term persistent. Right, so I'm story. saying, you know, the, the, the data center should be housed in the library, <gasps> rather than oh, in the I computing like center. institutional repositories, it was somewhere uh, under 10%. For cloud, which I didn't correlate directly to an institution, I just said cloud, uh, it was really small, 2, two or 3%. Yeah. That, that surprises me, actually. Yeah, well, I, the comments that I got were just, we don't have the money. It was a money issue. I mean, some people would upload it to their personal Google Drive if it was small enough, but at some point, it's just not robust enough. All right. All right. Um, no other questions for Stacy? In that case, let's thank Stacy again.